Franco, welcome back to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's been a couple of years. The world has changed, but thank you for coming back on. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to be back. Actually, you interviewed me after six months. I was back in sports science. So it's like yes. to meet an old friend now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like that. So we'll do, as always, we'll do a bit of an intro, but I'll try to frame the intro on this one because we had a little chat beforehand and I looked through your Twitter and Twitter's always the place I go before I do an interview because I see what people's on people's minds and I can kind of uh, maybe throw some things in there that, that people are talking to others about. But one thing that came up with you was a bit of a frustration from people saying that you're just an academic. Not that that's an issue, but it does that 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 finger pointing doesn't necessarily apply to you. So would you be able to give us a bit of a background and maybe use that framing uh, as you yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I was a bit disappointed because you know after I start to chase a bit uh, the some matrix and some concepts or dogmas call as you like, uh, the discussion moved more uh, on uh, toward the personal personal issue and I, I I was disappointed because first of all the idea that I'm just an academic it doesn't apply to me at all so considering that I joined uh, full-time the academic uh, an academic position in 2018 so before I never worked full-time for an academic position so it, it, it's quite weird uh, and the, the other the, the other reason is that I mean there's nothing bad to be an academic but the reason why people uh, commented that I'm just an academic is like to say, okay, Franco is, uh, is more keen to these methodological issues, uh, which are just uh, academic discussion. And in reality, it's the, the other way around. <laughs> I'm, I care about the methodology because I care about the information we provide to practitioners. And that's why I think it's important. Otherwise, you know, why we, we are doing research. If we can say whatever we want without meeting the scientific requirements of, uh, of what we say. So, yeah, I, I was a bit disappointed. And I, as I told you before, I spent the first part of my career as a coach. I was uh, 10 hours a day. I was training and testing athletes, and they did this until 31. And and I had my first athletes in, in some Olympic Games in, in Sydney in 2000. And so I, I start the research career when I was 31 and I got my PhD action in 2009. So is is uh, about 20 years I'm in research and I'm 50. So it really doesn't apply to me. And if this is an argument used to, to detract my arguments, uh, I mean, I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit um, not the best way to, to to discuss it with me, especially because as I said, it doesn't apply to me that, that this accusation in some ways. Yeah, but yeah. it's fine. I mean, but you've coached athletes at Olympic Games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had my first athletes in uh, in Sydney. I had the three athletes actually uh, that I trained directly. Uh, but I work for a, a sports science uh, a, a private research center. Uh, um, built to support the athlete sponsored by an Italian company. So as a staff, I had, I don't know, probably 10, 10 athletes that we were uh, supporting as a center in, in that first Olympic Games. And I had other athletes uh, also in, in, uh, in the Winter Olympic Games. Uh, I had the snowboarder, uh, who is also a good friend of mine now. And yeah, until when I was in Switzerland, I was the fitness coach of the uh, the Swiss national team of fencing uh, until Rio de Janeiro. So, and other than training, and there was an athlete that was training. So, uh, I would say that I had quite a lot of experience uh, because the first 10 years I really did a lot in terms of training. Probably too much, probably I was too young, but that w <laughs> that was the work. So, I couldn't, I couldn't choose when uh, some, sometimes I receive a call uh, telling me, okay, from tomorrow, we sponsor, I don't know, a marathon, some Kenyan runners, uh, you and, and the other, and the other, you should follow and train and testing these Kenyan runners without any experience, actually. <laughs> so it was a bit, uh, it was not easy. Um, 
my first study was on mountain biking because uh, it happened exactly what I said. I received a call and I was told, okay, from uh, the next week you are the new <laughs> coach of the of our mountain bike team because the, the the former coach was moving with the professional cycling team completely, and so. Uh, for in one week, I had to learn how to train mountain bikers. I was lucky because uh, my former boss uh, that unfortunately passed away was the trainer of the coach of uh, Cadel Evans and very, very strong uh, cyclist. Uh, he helped me a lot. So I, I, I learned to coach uh, and, to, and to train thanks to, to Aldo Sassi, who was uh, my former boss. It was a good experience. Sometimes it was traumatic. Absolutely, because you know you, you are young. You you never know if you are doing something right. Uh, you are always afraid to cause some problem, injuries uh, on athletes that are that were maybe famous and pay a lot. Uh, but it, it was a hard school, but it was very effective. I I should say. Mm-hmm. Just to break the conversation, Franco. Just when you when you touch the table, it sometimes picks up on your mic. So just keep keep your hand keep your hands on the table or off. Yeah, it just it just picks up on the mic. Do you know if you if you put your hands down like that, it yeah, just okay. picks up a little bit. But that's fine. That's fine. Right, I'm making out of that. Oh, seven, eight, five. Right, so let's let's have a little chat around Nordics. Nordics Nordics are the most discussed exercise. Well, on this podcast is what I know, but in the wider community as well. Can you give us a little bit of a history of the research into Nordics? And then we'll have a little chat around the meta-analysis and what you guys did uh, more recently. Yeah, actually, um, as you said, Nordic camping uh, is a hot exercise, hot topic, and especially because it's related to injury prevention and everything around injury is hot in this moment. Uh, because it is actually one of the main concerns and problems we have in sport. Um, when I read the first time the, the meta-analysis on the British Journal of Sport Medicine, I realized there were some errors and quite, let's say, obvious errors. Uh, but at that time, you know, it, it happens often to read papers that have some limitation or methodological problems. Uh, but over time, I, I read a lot on social media or other papers um, referring to this meta-analysis as a sort of, uh, you know, there's a strong evidence. And sometimes I, I've seen that this meta-analysis used to, to stop the conversation uh, with, uh, with, um, with, with people that had different perspective and basically saying, okay, there is a meta-analysis, so you shut up and and don't question uh, the evidence. The problem is that the, there were some errors. So what we did was to just reanalyze, trying to fix some of the, the errors, and it came out that the, the uncertainty around the, the estimation of the effects was not as strong as uh, uh, appearing in, the, in, in, the, in that meta-analysis. Uh, initially, we... We sent a letter, actually, 800 words to British Journal of Medicine. Uh, the letter was, uh, it was a letter discussion, was rejected. And so I, I spoke with Van Smeden, who is an epidemiologist, and, uh, and another my colleague, Alan McCall, and we decided to um, basically to reanalyze and to complete a new meta-analysis, try to fix a, 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 a series of errors, and we just presented the new estimates. So it's, it's, it's nothing strange in science. Uh, that's normal. Uh, of course, uh, being a hot topic, uh, um, when we published this, uh, uh, there were some reactions, some good, some bad. I mean, the, the good reaction were basically uh, from people that uh, were not convinced about the the efficacy of the Nordic camps thing, or we're convinced uh, that other kind of exercise like sprinting potentially are more effective. Uh, so at one point I found myself in, in between these two, uh, these two sides. Um, I didn't have any sides actually, we just reanalyzed 
um, the studies and we just uh, repeat the, we try to replicate basically the meta-analysis. And the, the, the fact is that once you apply the correct methods, the results are not strong as uh, claimed in the original meta-analysis, but also in previous meta-analysis, uh, even uh, uh, in another one recently. Um, so we just said, okay, the, the effectiveness of the Nordic camps in based on the literature is not that strong. The uncertainty around the, the estimates is quite uh, wide. We also calculate the so-called prediction interval, which is something that should be always done when you use uh, random effect models for the meta-analysis, which is basically, it's an, an interval that, uh, uh, that um, indicates um, where uh, the, 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 the effect can uh, lie if you repeat the intervention in, a, in, a, in another population. So it's very, it, it's very important actually. It's, it's something that should be always presented in this kind of meta-analysis. And the, the, the effects are maybe potentially very, very good, uh, impressively good, but may also be, um, the, let's say, the, they may also be harmful. So based on the results, we cannot exclude that the Nordic cancer can be even harmful at the moment. Maybe in the future, the, 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 the situation will be clearer. Uh, I don't know, but that's, that's uh, a bit uh, what, we, what we show. Apart from that one error that you spoke about there, it spoke about there and, and explained, what other errors were in the initial meta-analysis? Yeah, the, the, in layman's um, terms, Franco. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One, one of the error is to combine uh, observational and randomized trials. Uh, this is something that you almost never, you, you shouldn't almost never um, do because uh, um, it's a bit mixing orange and apples. So the it's not methodologically is not correct unless very specific and special situations that uh, do not apply in this in this case uh, so the first issue is to separate observational from randomized trial especially if according to the authors of the meta-analysis you want to estimate the efficacy or effectiveness the other problem was that um the, the authors, uh, uh, and not only the, uh, the authors of the British Journal of Medicine Review, but also previous authors, uh, combine studies uh, that use uh, packages of uh, exercises or prevention programs that included Nordic camping as one of the exercises, but not the only one. And this is uh, probably the biggest error, because as you can imagine, if you have two, three, four, or 11 exercises like in the 11 plus, you cannot uh, attribute the effect of uh, the program to one exercise. Because following the same uh, approach, uh, for example, in 11 plus, there is also, uh, there are jump, jump exercises or the plank or whatever. So uh, this means that if I run a, a new meta-analysis on the effect of jump exercises on injury prevention, I, I would use the same estimates of the 11 plus to, to this exercise. So I cannot use the estimates to each of the 11, 10, whatever exercises. So even if you don't have a, a statistical or methodological knowledge, it's easy to understand that there's something wrong there. So, and the, uh, uh, saying that exercises exercise or programs, including Nordic answering, reduce the injury risk is a sort of trick to to, to hidden a bit that these programs uh, include the packages of exercises and not only one. So what we did was to separate the studies and select only the, the, the studies that use the Nordic hamstring uh, in isolation as a prevention program. That's the only way to understand if that specific exercise is effective or not. And this, of course, reduced a lot the number of studies and the, the, using the original uh, studies, only five met the inclusion criteria. And since we updated, we found, uh, we found uh, a new study. So at the end, we had just six studies. The other, the other problem, which is quite common, is the use of the risk of bias uh, assessment, 
which is unfortunately often wrong um, because the uh, it's, it's not easy to rate and to use these tools because there are some items that require some technical knowledge. So for example, if there is an item asking if the randomization was, uh, um, was done properly, um, sometimes people read the, 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 the participants were randomized, they think this is enough. In reality, it's not enough. The, you should write exactly how you randomize. And you can understand that something wrong or something that was not explained when you see studies in which the groups are, for example, have equal numbers of participants, which means that the, the, the groups, the randomization was restricted. There are techniques to restrict the, the randomization, but you should write how because uh, this can introduce bias. So that's just an example uh, uh, using one item of these tools, but it's important to evaluate uh, properly the quality and the risk of bias of the study. So the other finding is that the studies were almost all at the high risk of bias. And saying that they are at high risk of bias is not a negative comment uh, uh, about the authors. I mean, there are some problems that cannot be solved. Uh, there's no way to, for example, to um, uh, conceal the treatment uh, or, uh, I mean, it cannot be blind. I mean, you cannot, uh, people know, people know that they are completing the Nordic camps and there's no way to, to use a placebo in, in that situation. There are other ways actually to, to mask a bit, to, to, to try to limit this problem. But this is uh, something that uh, cannot be solved in, uh, in studies like that. That's why these are pragmatic studies. These are not typical randomized trials. These are pragmatic trials, which is fine, but introduce bias. So uh, saying that these studies have a high risk of bias uh, doesn't mean to say that the authors or the researchers were bad people, that did something wrong. It's just a limitation. And, and it remains a limitation. <laughs> There's nothing we can do, and we have to consider and, and think about these limitations when we interpret the data. So what we found was that the, using these new criteria, there are other two, uh, two, three, other two, three problems that are very technical, so I don't, uh, I don't spend too much time on that. But when we reanalyze using the, the appropriate methods, it came out that the uncertainty is very, uh, is very large and, the, and the, um, there are le much less studies that can be used for this kind of analysis. And most of the studies are, are at a high risk of bias. So that the evidence is not that strong as people have claimed or are still claiming. So with the meta-analysis that you reanalyzed, and your new meta-analysis, what does this mean? What does it mean for practitioners? What does this new information mean for practitioners out there deciding how to use Nordics, when to use Nordics, if they use Nordics? What's your stance on how this applies to the, in practice? Yeah, I'm happy you're asking this because this is an important point. Um, I think in general, in all the studies I'm, I have done, I'm doing, I think uh, what is important is to provide practitioners the information based on which they make the decision. You know, we don't have to decide for them. We can, for example, uh, we, we use the grade uh, to, to recommend, uh, to provide recommendations, and the grade is another, is a guideline to, 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 to weight the different problems and to come out with a recommendation. And the recommendation only for football was conditional. So conditional recommendation means that the, the decision to use or not should be based on, on the estimates and should be based on preference and values of the stakeholders and the people involved in the team, uh, the players. And it seems to me that and this is not really, really considered in most of the recommendations in sport, uh, while it's much more considered in clinical setting. One of the problems is that we don't know the values and the preference of every context in which we want to apply these, uh, these training programs. Um, to give an example, um, there may be exercises that, that introduce some risk that are acceptable for me in my context, but are not acceptable for you. So uh, uh, 
it, it's really context dependent. So basically, the what can change is just that people don't have to expect too much. What I, I question is the claim that Nordic camps decrease the injury by 50 or even more, 70-80%. And I question not only because uh, we have shown that it's not like that, because also the 50% ca coming out from those uh, meta-analyses is not uh, the effect uh, of the Nordic camps thing, but uh, here I try not to be too technical, but is, uh, an, um, is the average of a series of effects that you can have when you implement the, the, this prevention program because they use a, a random and we use a random effect model. Um, which means that the effect may be different in different populations, more or less. Um, so uh, what I question is uh, that um, by claiming that you can halve the, the risk of injuries, you are creating too much expectations. And we all know that implementing Nordic MC, you don't cut half the injury risk. Because if this would happen, we, we, we wouldn't be here to discuss would be so evident that there would be no discussion. And normally people say, yeah, but it's multifactorial, so you you don't you cannot expect to find this uh, huge uh, uh, drop in injury in real setting. But the studies, these are pragmatic studies, so these are done in real setting. So why this should happen in all the studies based on some authors and not in real setting, first. Second, and this, I think it depends a bit on... Uh, on the background and the education of people. A, a 50, 70, 80% lower risk is huge. So this is something that when you implement in your team or your setting, you would you would see almost uh, all the times because it's really huge. It's uh, huge. So even the, the practical experience uh, that doesn't fit these numbers. So what changes? Just that we we provide a, a different information. We provided the different information. So we we said, okay, based on on the, the reanalysis, you can have a very important reduction in injury risk. You can also have a, an increase in injury risk based on the results of the studies. Whether to use or not, it's up to you. It's not up to me. It's it's up to the team and the staff. You, you have to decide whether to use or not. Maybe you say, okay, I think that at the end of the day uh, that the risk is acceptable or you don't believe there's a, this, such a risk. Okay, you can use. But it's different than uh, showing up to a team and saying you have to implement the Nordic cancer because you can have the injury risk. Because it doesn't happen. That's the point. It, it, it doesn't happen. So from a practical point of view, it may not change a lot eh, because uh, you can go on using the Nordic camps thing. And we, as we said, uh, as we wrote in the meta-analysis, we didn't suggest to stop using. We just said, these are the results. Uh, the recommendations are conditional. So up to you. you. You can decide whatever you like. You can use it. You can decide to use something else. It's fine. But based on this information, that in our opinion were more um, uh, consistent with the literature. So it doesn't change. So it may not change a lot. So when you're talking about the in, understand the level of risk, that's potentially because what you find in your meta analysis that it could potentially be harmful. Yes, and it could potentially uh, yeah. be a positive. Yeah, yeah. yes, the estimates uh, um, uh, range from very huge reduction in injury risk uh, to depending on the kind of analysis we could use. We use parametric and non-parametric analysis, but anyway. Using one analysis was fifty percent more, and another analysis was three times more uh, the 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 risk of injury. So, and based on the results, this cannot be excluded. Uh, you may think it doesn't. These are to you is not likely to have an increased injuries, but it's just your opinion. It's not based on the evidence, and this is what we try to explain. The idea that it doesn't increase the, the, the risk is a personal opinion. It's not based on the evidence. Of course, the, uh, uh, I don't know if, if you know, uh, um, I had a friendly, actually, at the end debate with uh, Christian Torborg. Yes. 
uh, yeah. because they presented another kind of analysis in which they restricted the analysis on uh, football only and they excluded uh, protocols that were, in their opinion, not uh, not good for some reasons. And we, we in our reply, we just explained that while I understand what they have tried to do, this is not... Uh, this is not cor correct in uh, methodologically because you cannot uh, change the research question in order to restrict the studies to a to few to to to, to few positive ones in the, in this case because I can do the same I can create a new research question in which based on my research question I select the studies that uh, uh, for example show less effectiveness uh, so. Uh, that, that's not the way. The only way you should do that uh, is to examine all the literature. You can run sub-analysis, but the problem of the sub-analysis uh, is that these are like um, analysis like in observational studies. So they, you, can, you can guess that maybe the, in a certain population, certain population may be more effective uh, uh, than in others, but Actually, you don't know. So the question I had with Christian is about the criteria they use in the new, in their new analysis because they reanalyze because they excluded completely other studies. The only way you can do that is having enough studies because they we don't have enough studies. That's a problem. But having enough studies, you present the estimates of different populations, and you discuss both, knowing that the analysis can be biased because uh, it's uh, observational in nature. So that was the, the main discussion. Not that I didn't agree with their, um, with, with, with their uh, um, attempt to, to run a sub-analysis. We just did not agree with uh, creating a new research question and completely excluding some studies because this is uh, prone to bias. Uh, I'm, I'm the, uh, again, the bias, or um, even if you use the term cherry picking, um, I know it, it can be interpreted in a tough way and as a, a bit impolite, uh, but this is a risk. And sometimes the bias is uh, involuntary. You don't do on purpose. You 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 may think that something is uh, is uh, effective. I can understand Christian because uh, they run one of the biggest studies uh, on on Nordic camps and they found impressive uh, results so he was personally involved and and so i can uh, i can understand that uh, uh, christian and co-authors uh, believe strongly believe uh, it's effective but as a researcher I, I i have to rely on all the results that are present in the literature so i have i have to try to be objective and as i said it doesn't mean that you don't have to use anymore the Nordic cancing, but you cannot. Uh, if you say that you can alter the uh, the risk of injury, is, is is wrong. It's simply wrong. You may have answered my next question already, but what? How how can we become? How can we get more information? And I'm guessing that is more high quality research in this area. Uh, that's that's a that's a huge question and. Um, and it's a very generic question because uh, it doesn't touch only the Nordic camps. It touches all the studies that are done in sports science and sport medicine. I think we 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 have a problem in sports science and medicine, which is the quantity. We have a lot of studies, and most of these studies are are of low quality. Uh, so what we need in the future, in, in my opinion, is to do less and better. That's the only way. To, to move forward. Um, unfortunately, and I understand, especially because now I live in the academic environment, so I know how it works, that the publish and perish culture has ruined the sector uh, because a lot of researchers have to publish and most have to publish a lot. In some countries, the progression in career and salaries are related to public, the number of publications, not on the quality, to the quality of the publications. So, I think there are a lot of studies which are basically motivated by academic uh, necessity for career advancement and these kind of things. 
So to improve in this field, we need to do less and better. That, there's no other way. And that's why we are insisting on, on the research methodology. Because this is not an academic discussion. This is an important discussion because we are providing information to practitioners, coaches, and physiotherapists, and the medical staffs. So we need to provide honest information. We don't have to create new dogmas or claiming things just to become famous and popular on social media or whatever. We just need to provide information, honest information, and coaches can decide. Because, and this is my coach uh, background, sometimes it seems to me that researchers uh, think that c coaches are, I don't know, morons, brainless, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean... Uh, it's, it's like I, I had a, another interview about load management, you know, now there's also this issue of load management. And I tried to explain, yes, but do you think that the coaches don't know that uh, the athletes should recover? So, I mean, this is something we always did. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm relatively old, but when I started 30 years ago to train, we were all aware about the importance of recovery. And when they play a lot, for example, when they play in soccer, when they play during the week, uh, you balance the training load in the other days. You don't just add the, the game and the, the remaining training remain the same. So you always try to balance. So the, the concept of load management is okay. I mean, I have nothing against, but it's something to me quite obvious. So I don't see this uh, new, you know, new strategy. So uh, to come back to your original question, if we want to move forward, we need to do uh, better studies. We need to be more accurate in the data, in the data collection. I, I can tell you, it's a couple of years. I, I just finished uh, two hours of the uh, of course today because I'm trying to find good data. Uh, or because I have some ideas for some studies. The problem is that even data that have been published several times, in my opinion, are very bad. There are a lot of missing data. There are things that I don't understand. I ask to the people uploading the data in these big databases, and they told me that the data we uploaded were rubbish. And these are the data used to, to publish, which is, uh, if you think, is uh, it's not uh, very good. Uh, it's not very good. So we, we need to be a bit honest and, and realize that we, we, we are pushing too much uh, towards quantity and we are forgetting the quality. And that's why I'm insisting uh, about, about uh, improving quality. And I know I may, I may look uh, uh, sometimes harsh or uh, uh, a dickhead, but uh, <laughs> at, the end, uh, at the end, we are researchers. So we, are, uh, we are doing science and... And uh, that's our job. And I understand there are some necessities for for the uh, academic uh, career or whatever, but we should find a, a compromise at one point. Otherwise, I don't see the difference between us as researchers and the, the gurus uh, out there. I remember watching a presentation from, from Ben Jones here in the UK, who's at, at Leeds Beckett University, and he's, he said, uh, researchers think coaches are stupid. And coaches think researchers are, and academics are weird, and I thought that's that's probably uh, that was probably quite accurate. How it comes, the, everyone's thinking uh, something about the, the the other side. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And actually, it's funny. That's why I was disappointed what people said that I'm an academic, uh, because uh, in reality, I know and I speak uh, often with coaches, uh, and what I see. If I, I I want to be really honest now. What I see is that most coaches uh, training athletes that uh, have also won the last Olympic Games, they don't give a shit about the research. They don't even read the research. They have no idea. We are discussing about things that they have no idea. And they go on training, and in my opinion, they train very well. Sometimes I think uh, this is good. They don't follow some kind of research because I don't think that some kind of research is really helpful. Uh, so it seems to me that most researchers that think to be connected in some ways with the field, they are not. They are completely disconnected because uh, I cannot tell you the names, but there are also here in Australia coaches that are very good. They didn't use anything about all these uh, things that we are discussing. 
uh, I see how they train. They train very well. Uh, they don't use one exercise, so the discussion if trust is better than the squat, because most of them, they use both. Uh, so if, if I start to discuss with them, uh, what do you think is better for them? It's almost an, uh, it's not, not even a question they use both. And this is the same. I was thinking what I was doing and I'm doing with an, with an athlete. And, and also for, for training the hamstring. We use a lot of exercises from bridge, deadlifts, and not only Nordic uh, hamstring exercises. So I, I agree with Ben that there's the, this idea uh, that the, the, the coaches are, are stupid. But I agree with the coaches that sometimes the studies are completely disconnected by uh, the reality of the field. So I can, I can see both both points. When I was training, uh, I read all the studies on fencing, and I found completely useless because, you know, the the the, the study showing that the 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 explosive power is important. I mean, I know it's enough. You watch a a competition and you understand that it's important, or, or that the novice uh, I have, uh, are less powerful than uh, elite athletes. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> now. So I, I I know perfectly. I mean that's not a, a huge discovery. So I can, from a coach perspective, if I read a paper like that, uh, what, what do you think I uh, uh, would be my consideration of the sports scientist? You know, or or when I read some papers in which they they use. I, I'm insisting a lot about that because, in my opinion, is an error. Of some studies, training studies, in which the athletes use uh, um, uh, programs in which they reach uh, exhaustion and fatigue in each uh, set, which is something you never do or you rarely do in, in training. The, 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 you don't reach fatigue. Uh, you don't really work at repetition maximum every time, especially if you are if you are practicing sport in which power. There are other components of the training. If you are a sprinter, you have to sprint. Uh, so you have also to consider other parts of the training or when I was working with combat sport, they have to, to, to fight. They have to, to, they have to spar. So, I mean, you have to balance the training with the other part, technical and tactical training. So yes, I think uh, Ben touched a good point. Yeah. One thing we discussed back in 2019, because it was very much still a, a hot topic back then, was the acute chronic workload ratio. And I want to revisit it because it's, what, nearly three years on, because it was in March, nearly three years on. It seems to have died down a little bit. The hype seems to have died down, but I'm guessing it's... I'd like to get your opinion on how it's been used in practice. Now it has died down, but where are we at with the acute chronic workload ratio? And is it is it still been implemented from your experience in in in, in applied settings and how? You know, my experience is biased because people that contact me are people they don't want to use or they are critical about the acute chronic. So I, I, I would say uh, it seems to me that is uh, used much less uh, because uh, I have this contact. In reality, I have seen there, is, there was a bit of, of a drop in the number of publications. Uh, and interestingly, more publications showing there's no relation, which is a bit weird before three years ago there were most of all the papers show something now there are much more papers showing something um i i receive a lot of contact to collaborate for studies on the acute chronic and i i tell you i i didn't i didn't want to collaborate because i i don't care i mean we we have shown the problems of the acute chronic we have published uh, in my opinion one conclusive paper in which we show that if you substitute the chronic with a, a randomly generated number, you have the same relation. Of course, this paper was almost ignored uh, because, as I said, I haven't really discussed about these methodological issues. So most of the discussion that happened in the last few years uh, were more changing the narrative. So. Uh, people saying yes, you know, but uh, it's good to to use the the acute chronic for tracking progression. Okay, but it was not proposed to check progression. If you think it's good to check progression, we can discuss. I I, I think personally that it's not even good to check progression. 
for several reasons. The main reason is that the, there is a ratio, which is a sort of percentage, and it's plenty of literature showing why the percentage and, and, and the ratios are, are dangerous and not very good. Um, so there was really a change in the narrative in the, in the discussion, which, in my opinion, uh, it's more a justification from people that propose and are using the accrued chronic. So basically, I refuse to collaborate in other studies uh, because I don't, uh, I'm not interested anymore. We have shown uh, the problems, we have expressed our uh, concerns, and now people, as I said, they can decide to do whatever they want. If they want to use it, they can go on. Um, it seems to me is uh, the, the relying on, on, on the acute chronic is, is uh, going down, honestly. Uh, but I don't know, it may be just a biased perspective. One thing, uh, Franco, it'd be interesting to get your, or be really useful to get your input on the use of ratios as a whole and the potential problems that come with using ratios, because we've got loads that we use, RSI being one obvious one that, that has been used everywhere. Would you be I able know. to give us a bit of an inf <laughs> a bit of uh, insight into problems that come when we're using ratios? Yeah, most of the problem of the ratios uh, that, by the way, the first studies um, addressing the problem of the ratios uh, can be back uh, are probably one century ago. The, the, the Pearson wrote something about that, but there there are there are really a lot of studies showing uh, the problems of the ratio from a statistical perspective. Again, people may say. Yeah, but it's just a statistical issue, or is an academic... Uh, no, it's not. Because the, the these statisticians have explained that, for example, there is a problem of asymmetry in percentage and the ratios, because uh, the, the, um, the typical example uh, is that if you go up and down of, let's say, 10%, when you go down, since uh, the, you, you go down from a bigger number, you are decreasing, you are decreasing, let's say, 20%, uh, and you go from 1,000 to 800. But when you go back to 1,000, the percentage is higher than 20% because it's 800. So this is just to explain the asymmetry of the matrix. If you increase 10% every week, every 10% uh, every week is uh, uh, over a bigger number. So the increase is not linear, it's curvilinear. Uh, the other problem of the ratio is that normally you use the ratio to uh, to normalize. Uh, that's the reason why you, you use the ratio. So you want to control for the denominator, um, for the, the values at the denominator. Uh, and that's a problem because most of the time, unless the relation between the numerator and denominator is a specific one, the, this, uh, the ratio uh, does not normalize. And this is the study that uh, has been published by Lolly and colleagues uh, on the British Journal of Sport Medicine when they introduced the, the issue of the coupling and uncoupling. Unfortunately, that study was not uh, understood and still is not. Uh, people uh, uh, still are not getting the message of that study. Because in their study, they showed that um, if you use uh, uh, at the denominator the, the last four weeks uh, that included the last week, uh, there is a problem of, uh, of mathematical coupling. And so people start to use the uncoupled version. But it's pointless to use the uncoupled version because in their study, basically what they said is that if you want to normalize the acute load by the chronic, uh, the, first, the first prerequisite is that there is no mathematical coupling. Once you don't have the mathematical coupling, so you divide by the week two and five instead of one and four, you can try to see if the, the normalization works. And what they have shown is that the normalization doesn't work. So the, the uncoupling is a prerequisite to test the ability of the ratio to normalize. So to normalize the acute by the chronic. Indeed, and we replicate the same analysis and we found exactly the same as expected. If you, if you correlate the chronic with the, acute, with the acute chronic ratio, you see there is a relation, which means that 
the 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 ratio does not normalize. Otherwise, you would have a flat relation, okay. And in, if you see the the scatter plot of Lolly and our publish on one year or two years later, so you see there is this relation, which means that depending on the level of the chronic load, you have a different level of the ratio. So the ratio is, is influenced, is still influenced by the chronic, which is a nonsense because you use the normalization to um, control for the chronic. So, and, and they showed this, uh, I think in 2017 was published online. And what I complain is that people ignore their two publications. And in their two publications, they anticipated what we found after three years, that is that the ratio created statistical artifacts. Because basically with the ratio you rescale in the acute chronic, as we explain, uh, you just rescale uh, the acute, uh, the effect of the acute load. So if you have uh, uh, 1.001, which is a 0.1% increase in the injury risk, which is nothing, if you divide by any number, you exponentiate this uh, this risk, and it, it becomes huge. It seems, wow, three, four times higher injury risk, but actually it's just a rescaling, is nothing. Uh, to give a, a, another example, it's like uh, if uh, I, I, I tell you, if uh, uh, if a player double the body weight, there is a huge risk of injury. Yeah, but I mean it, it makes no sense. I mean it's uh, when you rescale is the same because uh, one uh, um, the, when you see when you read the paper and it's written a uh, two times higher odd ratio, um, uh, two times uh, higher odd of having an injury, it means that for one unit increase in the ratio, which is uh, basically the, the, the value corresponding to the four weeks before. So when you double the chronic load, you have this increase in injury risk, which is something that it doesn't happen. And when it happens is because of very specific situation. For example, when uh, you, you, you start to play during the week, so you have one game more, so this automatically increase uh, most of the time the, the training load, which is something that you cannot avoid because you can say, no, we don't play the Champions League because otherwise we, we, we have more, we have too high training load. So if you exclude these specific situations, it doesn't happen uh, that there's a huge increase in, 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 training, uh, in training load. So basically, so basically the ratio uh, is is a, is a problem is absolutely a problem in in uh, and there's plenty of studies what i'm disappointed is that people didn't read the references in the studies of lolly for example in in our studies because if you read you understand that it's better you don't use the ratio and most matrix matrix that we have now are based on ratios and they use these ratios to to find the association these kind of things which are very likely are statistical artifacts. So ratio should, shouldn't be used. I, every time I see in any papers, in any field, the ratios, I'm always very skeptical. And there is a nice paper of uh, an epidemiologist who is very famous, and, uh, whose name is um, uh, Greenland, uh, explaining, for example, the problem of using the BMI, which is one of the most common commonly used uh, um, uh, anthropometric measure and and this is a problem because basically one of the problem of when you have a ratio is that you have two components in this ratio and you never know the effect of the, each of these components because you have a number that combine everything so you don't know if it's the effect is because it's increasing the numerator or is increasing the denominator so the best thing when you analyze this kind of data is to introduce for example in the model the acute, the chronic, and their interaction. That's the way. And this is what, for example, we have done in our study. And doing this, you don't have any effect. Uh, so there is no interaction between the acute and the chronic. The only way to have an effect is to use a ratio. And because this uh, rescale the risk in the, um, of, the, of, of the acute uh, load. So it's not an academic uh, discussion. It was a study to show that it's a statistical artifact. But people didn't care. They they have 
anyway, they have published, sometimes they have cited our paper in the wrong way, so they didn't, probably they didn't even read the paper, read the paper. Uh, why? I don't know, maybe, as I said, maybe just to have a one publication more. I don't know. We've got five or ten minutes left, Franco, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to mention the worst case scenario because we discussed that back in 2019, but there's been some development since then. So we've got five or ten minutes left that I'd love to get your update on that, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember well, because th- that was another uh, one of the issues that I was not convinced at that time. Uh, the the reason are basically two uh, that we have addressed in a, in a study that we have published. I don't remember. I think in Journal of Sports Sciences, I, something like that. Anyway, uh, one problem is conceptual because the idea to use the worst case scenario as a training benchmark uh, is physiologically a nonsense because basically what you are saying is that to improve the worst case scenario i just repeating the the worst case scenario um the, the the good thing of training is that we can target specific system a specific characteristic that may be um may be positive for the overall performance uh in addition uh the worst case scenario is uh influenced by a lot of contextual factors so it would make sense if the worst case scenario that you measure during game is a uh, a sort of maximal capacity of the players or something like that. In reality is not has nothing to do with the maximal capacity. It's a, a phase of high intensity activity which is influenced by a lot of factors, can be playing position, the kind of of uh, match, the importance of the match and, and so on. So what we have shown is that first of all is very is a very um, there is a high variability in individual worst case scenario. So um just to, to make you an example a practical example otherwise people say that i'm an academic if i train <laughs> uh, if i use a uh, 10 sprints because in the worst case scenario i have seen that there are uh, the players my player cover 10 sprints and after two months i measure a new worst case scenario which is 12 what does it mean that before using 10 i was under training my players or what if you think, uh, how do you reconcile this uh, conceptually to the new training? So why do you move to 12? And because of what I would say is that uh, probably you should have used 12 before and not only now. So basically what I'm saying is that if I want to improve something, I just try to understand what physical characteristic I need to improve and I design a training to improve those characteristics, which means not necessarily just repeating the worst case scenario, but uh, I can, for example, I can decide to do the double of the sprints of the worst case scenario. It makes sense uh, why I have to do exactly the worst case scenario. And this came out from a Delphi survey that we did uh, together with Alan McCall and other colleagues, uh, in which we found that a lot of um, uh, sports scientists or head of performance used the, uh, uh, the, the worst case scenario as a, uh, as a benchmark. So they try to reach the worst case scenario during this training. And as we said, it, it's um, we, we couldn't find a conceptual strong rationale for doing that. Because the, uh, as I said, if you need to improve uh, sprinting, you do whatever you need to improve sprinting. It can be also generic training, not just sprinting. So we have trying to demonstrate this. Again, we published that. I receive other offer to publish something else with other data, but it's the concept that that matters. Uh, I don't I don't care to publish ten times the same thing. So usually when I publish one or twice, I'm I'm done. I I, 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 I get bored very easily. About uh, I move on uh, as soon as I can. Yeah. So yeah, so, that's so what, what it, that was uh, what happened in for the worst case scenario in this in these two years. So what is the next thing, Franco? For you, uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, I would like to do some something more about the epidemiology of injury, because I think is an area that in which it can be done a lot, and in which the methods used are not strong. So a lot of uh, so-called risk factors uh, 
I'm not sure they are really risk factors. It most are, seems to me more the results of confounding. So, I mean, that's my impression. I have the confirmation because I'm working, collaborating with some epidemiologists, clinical epidemiologists actually, and they think that there are some problems. So I would like to do something more in this direction. The problem is to find good data. And this is where I'm really struggling in the last two years to find data that I trust. Because if I don't trust the data, I don't trust in my results. So I, I don't, I cannot find the motivation. So yeah, if I find the data, I hope I'm working on that. I'm trying to create a network of good uh, staff collecting the data properly that we can check uh, to, to share the data. Um, I think I'm going to do more in uh, injury epidemiology. Cool. If there's any well, if there's any questions, if people want to dive into any of the stuff that we've talked about, acute clinic wear up ratio, the Nordic stuff, where's the best place for people to check out your work, your thoughts? ResearchGate? Any good? Yeah, I mean I don't I have ResearchGate, but I don't I don't update okay. ResearchGate. Uh, okay. I, I have to be honest, uh, in the in the last period I I I'm less act, active on on uh, social media. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit bored to discuss always about the same things and, you know, so yeah, normally is, uh, social media are the best way to reach me, uh, or writing me emails. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, on ResearchGate, you can find the publication. I don't update, but it seems they are updating automatically. I don't know. <laughs> okay. A, I okay. don't follow a lot that, that, but yeah. Okay. And, and maybe podcast like your <laughs> of course of course well thank you very much franco it's great to catch up it's been no, it's no been way. too long and <laughs> um yeah thank you very much for giving up your time have a good thank rest you. of the evening oh, we'll speak thank soon thank you thank you very Cheers, much Franco. Bye. Bye-bye. bye bye